So I've been seeing a lot of people hating on the Seattle Seahawks for trading a second rounder and a fifth rounder next season for Leonard Williams because of his age 29. Of course, he is going to be a free agent in March. Not to mention, he definitely is regressing. 2020 was the best season of Williams' career, and he had as many sacks the past two seasons as he had in that breakout season. But you have to understand that if you're the Seahawks, right now you're in first place in the NFC West division. You're also coming off of a game against the Cleveland Browns where you couldn't stop the run. The Seahawks really haven't been able to stop the run much at all this season. And it, it makes sense why, specifically against the Browns, they were worse than normal is because Yuchenna Nwozu was placed on the IR. It's looking like his season is over. So it, his season is over. So that means that, well, Draymond Jones is going to need some help up front. And when you bring in Leonard Williams, you're getting a very good athlete. I mean, the guy's six foot five, 300 plus pounds. The Seahawks are going to be facing Christian McCaffrey. They're going to be facing DeAndre Swift and Derrick Henry this season. And that's just at the top of my head. Those are running backs that are just very difficult to be able to bring down. They've got some good offensive lines. So for Seattle, when you bring in Leonard Williams, you're getting a guy that can get after the quarterback. He had seven pressures, which was the best game of his season against, of course, the New York Jets last week for the Giants. But you're also getting a guy who can get after the running back that gets tackles for a loss. Since 2020, Williams has 25 tackles for a loss, 61 quarterback hits, and he's got 22 sacks. I love the move because it signals to me that, hey, look, we're in first place right now. The NFC is wide open. Everyone's talking about the AFC being wide open. But what about the NFC? You've got the Eagles, the Lions. you got the 49ers, the Seahawks. I mean, there are several teams here that are going to be able to compete in January. And Pete Carroll and John Snyder, all these guys do is win. So when you're giving up a second round pick, just just don't have it be in the top 14, right? Don't have it be in the top 15. And Carroll actually did speak to the media and he said it himself. He said it best that we just, we don't have top 10 picks very often. Now the Seahawks did have a top 10 pick. They got Devin Witherspoon, of course, the best corner in the class. You could argue Christian Gonzalez, but it's so close. These guys are both very good at playing football. But Witherspoon absolutely went off last week. And then against the Browns, they just didn't even throw the ball his way. They didn't put the ball his way at all, which goes to show how much respect they have for him as a rookie. When Seattle has those top 10 picks, they're going to make the most of it. And this is a team that has drafted very well in the second round. That That is my one concern, is that if Williams comes to the Seahawks and they don't win a Super Bowl, and then he leaves in free agency, so he's a one-year rental. Well, look at the players that the Seahawks have drafted in the second round. I'm not even a Seahawks fan. And I could tell you three or four at the top of my head right now that they got in the second round. Let's do it. So DK Metcalf, uh, they of course they drafted Kenneth Walker. I think it's a little bit too early to say Zach Charbonnet because he's a rookie, but he is a fantastic player. At, went absolutely off just on seven touches last week against the Browns. Boy, Mafe has had a sack in what five straight games. Bobby Wagner, I know, was a second round pick. I mean, D God, I said DK, right? Sorry, I'm a little bit under the weather, so I'm not able to remember everything. But I mean, those are some players right there that for second round picks. So that's just my concern is that I want Williams to be signed long term. Now he is 29, so you're not giving him anything crazy, but just have him under contract. But the thing that kind of counters that out is that, well, the Seahawks are paying less than $1 million for his $10 million salary this season. So to get a player, a Pro Bowl player for under 700,000 is a big time deal. And Draymond Jones has been playing his best football all season. So it's just so important to get him some help without Yuchen Nwozu. So oh yeah, it's, you know, speaking of Yuchen Nwozu, he was actually a second round pick now that I think about it by the Chargers. So for Seattle, defensively, they are absolutely elite. The run defense needs to be cleaned up, which will help with Williams. But everything else, I mean, you look at Jordan Brooks, who had, he forced a turnover, the first one in the game. You've got, of course, Tariq Woolen, who had an interception. He should have had two. Did have, of course, a penalty and you know, got beat once, put by Mark Hoover. But still, I mean, it, you're looking, I'm looking specifically at uh, Julian Love, who was a free agent pickup. He had an interception. Jamal Adams brushed the quarterback on a blitz, jumped up and batted it down. I'm loving what I'm seeing out of the Seattle defense. The offense, to me, though, is the question mark because offensively, I just don't think the Seahawks are where they need to be. They got out to such a good start, and then since then, they've been struggling, and their struggles continued against the Browns. So let's look at the good and the bad. So starting off with the good, because we'll be optimistic. So Geno Smith 
Of course, he led a game-winning drive. He, uh, the Seahawks in general had 362 net yards. They had 17 first downs. They went three for five in the red zone, and they had 6.7 yards per carry. I think the biggest winners from this game offensively are the wide receivers. So DK Metcalf goes five for 67. Jackson Smith and Jigba and Jake Oboe combined for six touches, 62 yards, and a touchdown. Tyler Lockett, eight for 87 had a toe tap catch as he normally does. I mean, Tyler Lockett is one of the greatest toe tap catches in the history of the NFL. If you're a diehard Seahawks fan or just a Seahawks fan, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about in the back left corner of the end zone. Uh, Russell Wilson threw it, of course. I mean, just an unbelievable play. Noah Fant had a 27 catch and run. I feel like a lot of tight ends would have went out of bounds, but to be able to fight off contact and put your, put your team in a position to succeed, put your team in a position to win a game, I mean, that's a big time play by fam. And the Seahawks have arguably the best tight end overall group in football. Offensive line pass protection was outstanding. Geno Smith was only hit three times in sack once against the Cleveland Browns. Last week, my Indianapolis Colts faced off against the Seahawks. Miles Garrett took over. I mean, he forced multiple fumbles. He blocked a field goal, was all over the place. And for the Seahawks to only allow that little of pressure this goes to show of how big time these guys stepped up and give credit to andy dickerson the offensive line coach for the seahawks he's one of the best in football and that was on full display in this game the bad though is that i did say dk had 67 yards but it was on 14 targets i thought smith missed some throws that he's got to make that he normally does make he is accurate he led the league in completion percentage last season but Smith, he did throw two interceptions, which you're not going to be able to make a case for him because they were just, not that they were necessarily bad, but they're plays that you just can't make. They're plays that you can't make when you're the quarterback on a first place team. And yes, the Seahawks are in first place over the 49ers. The Ravens are in first place in the AFC North, but I'll get into that in a little bit later. I mean, Smith, he had a stretch in this game where he went 11 for 22 for just 66 yards and two interceptions. I'd say at this point, Smith is playing like an average quarterback. Maybe you can make a case for a slightly above average quarterback, but he just hasn't been good the past two, past three weeks. And the Seahawks, yes, they had 17 points on three consecutive drives to start the game, but what did they do after that? Of course, every drive ended in a punt or an interception until the final touchdown, of course, when they had that screen pass and... DK Metcalf made a hell of a block, so a 33% third down conversion rate is not very good, but against the Browns, that actually is above average. In Seattle, they were up 17-7 to at one point, and then all of a sudden, fourth quarter, they're down 20-17, to and thankfully, Jamal Adams was able to make a hell of a play, and speaking of giving yourself, your team a chance to win. And then defensively, even though the Seahawks, to me, are an elite defense, they definitely have flaws. Uh, it's basically the run defense against the screen. I mean, you have to realize that you know, P.J. Walker didn't really have a good game, but it's the fact that Cleveland had 257 yards through the air on just 16 completions. I'd say over half of that came on screens. 155 yards on the ground on 40 attempts. I mean, the Browns had a 43% success rate. And even outside of that, just... But Seattle, they got a lot of production from the secondary. They got a lot of production from Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner, who, to no one's surprise, led the team in tackles. But I feel like there's just a couple of things that just need to be cleaned up, and I'm hoping that Leonard Williams can do that, which if you can trade for Leonard Williams, you've got to be able to do that because I feel like the Seahawks can use him more than anyone just with where their weaknesses are at. Like everything I just named you guys is going to be cleaned up single-handedly by Leonard Williams because he's that good and that's what they need. And then Boy Mafe, I mean, Jamal Adams, Julian Love, Tariq Woolen, like these guys balled out as they normally do. But against the Ravens, you have to realize that Baltimore, their defense has the second fewest passing yards per game and the fewest points per game. Gus Edwards hit three rushing touchdowns last week, 80 yards on 19 carries. In the last two games, Edwards has four touchdowns and has averaged 6.6 .6 yards per touch. You guys probably don't know this, but... You know, Gus Edwards has, I believe he's top three in NFL history in yards per carry. You could fact check me on that. I remember I read that somewhere. So you could fact check it if you want. But So he's one of the most efficient running backs in the history of the NFL. But Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner, they both had 10 plus tackles. Of course, Wagner had 13, whereas Brooks had 10. And then this game, I think, is going to come down to who gets off to a better start because the Ravens are second in first quarter scoring. The Seahawks are third. Lamar Jackson versus Geno Smith, I don't think it's going to be that simple. But Jackson at home is absolutely elite. Geno Smith on the road is, is pretty good, 93.8 QB rating. 
it's really going to come down to the first and the fourth quarter. You could say that about every football game, but if the Seahawks are able to get two touchdowns from Smith, I think they're going to win this game. Like, we'll come back to this video. If Geno Smith has two touchdown passes, the Seahawks will win this game. And if they don't win this game, he won't. I really think it's going to be that simple. And the Seahawks are also 5-0 and when scoring at least 20 points. So if the Seahawks can put up more than 20 points, they're probably going to win this game. So maybe it is that simple. Maybe it is as simple as Geno Smith. If he plays well, they win. If he doesn't, they lose.